If ever you are wondering how we got to the situation where you can pay $100 for a brand new game and then still spend dozens or hundreds or even thousands of extra dollars in order to unlock all the features in the game in order to make you have a complete experience, then perhaps it is good to know some of the history that has led to how video games have been monetized in the past starting way back when. I discovered this channel Kira TV some time ago and I've been watching his videos while I'm doing other things like pulling the weeds in the garden or chopping some wood like a peon in real life and uh, I have enjoyed his uh, historical perspective on a number of topics. I think he's a great narrator and I wanted to check out his content with you guys and I would recommend really to check out his work via the link that I paste in the description on YouTube and in Twitch because I think it's worth a sub if you decide after we watch this video that you like the content as well. So this is the history of video game monetization by Kira TV. Let's go take a look. Welcome to the future of the internet. What the f Fallout New Vegas has its first downloadable content. Nintendo video games may be the most addictive toy in history. A quarter each for Escape, which can last a long time if you're skilled. How we consume and pay for video games and subsequently the content within them has changed dramatically over the years, from the explosion of arcades to the first popular home Look consoles and then onto the digital era of downloadable content, microtransactions and beyond. To understand where we're going, we need to look at where we came from. This is a brief history of video game monetization. A popular sentiment in today's video game landscape is that microtransactions are a new concept that ruined at least some aspects of gaming, particularly... And the reason is sometimes uh, and 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 this is an argument that i think cannot be stated often enough and i'm sure he'll talk about it later and sorry to interrupt but we'll, we'll watch again soon the moment you start selling parts of gameplay in game as a developer you are incentivized to start restricting access to things that would have otherwise been available to everyone that purchased the game you're incentivized to restrict it because otherwise there would not be any need for people to buy it so you're always you're always in some way making the game worse for the free to play player or for the person that did pay by buying the game up front but then is being asked to spend extra on microtransactions even one of the most ethical free to play games path of exile they are still making sure that you have small stash space so that you can buy the extra stash space via the in-game microtransactions but i think that's reasonable because yeah in theory they make the game worse for a non-stash space purchaser but it's a free-to-play game. Devs need to eat bread too. Their chimney needs to smoke too. Their dog needs to eat too. So like, there's gotta be something, some reason. You could even claim that not giving the cosmetics in some games that are free-to-play and cosmetic sale only, not giving the cosmetics to everyone is making the games worse, right? So you do have to draw the line somewhere. Where is it fair to draw the line? The ones that come from the largest companies in the industry. However, microtransactions are where games started and all we've done is go full circle. In fact, the first era of monetization in this industry is probably the worst one we've ever had. The first big boom of commercial gaming happened inside the arcade. The monetization here was simple and originated as many gaming innovations do in Japan. In 19... Yeah, I guess that is where it came from. I remember playing on uh, arcades in Spain with my brother. It was like one... 100 peseta 100 peseta which was spain's coin which is like uh, I, I don't i don't know like a euro or something i don't know exactly what the conversion rate is but if you wanted to continue you have to put in coins that's of course where it started someone in chat said it's not reasonable to strong arm people even in path of exile's case i think it's bad business practice i think it's not strong arming strong arming sounds like there's some kind of coercion and you're never coerced to play a game especially if it's free to play if by the time you realize that the stash space costs money uh, and, and you think that's unfair then you just stop playing there's no strong arming that's my opinion on that and the second part is i think you do have a reasonable point with different terminology if you think that any form of restriction in game for money is bad business practice including stash space or cosmetics this means you are extremely opposed to the free-to-play payment model in general because true free-to-play of course doesn't exist that would be a developer that made a game spends millions to develop it and then earns not a single dollar just has cost that doesn't make sense 
So maybe it would be fair to say that you are someone that only enjoys paying once for the game and then owning it forever. Though, of course, owning is between quotation marks, as generally on Steam and in many other game developers, you don't own the game, you have a license to play it. And the only thing you own is your Monopoly game board that you have in cardboard uh, in an old cupboard somewhere. 1965, an electromechanical arcade shooting submarine simulator would release, which was designed by Nakamura Manufacturing Co., which later went on to be known as Namco, a company you probably will have heard of. A year later, the game known domestically as Torpedo Shooter would go on to yeah. be redesigned by Sega Enterprises. They iterated upon the original three-player cumbersome machine, to a single player experience small enough that they could export to foreign markets. In 1968, the rebranded game now known as Periscope gave birth to the method of payment for an entire era, the quarter fed arcade cabinet. Yeah. This I would point to as the origin and the proof of concept for microtransactions <sighs> in gaming, though instead of paying wow. for a new skin or some additional content, you were paying for the ability to rent some game time. The games that followed Periscope's innovation would adopt this same model, and arcades started to pop up globally, competing mostly with other coin-fed operational games like slot machines and pinball. It wasn't, however, until the late 70s that the arcade golden era would begin. <laughs> Typically for a market to truly... Ex <laughs> well, I, I, I wonder, Th think for a second what we're seeing here, yeah? Is this two people in their natural environment that are happening to be filmed? Or is this <laughs> actually staged? Because I feel, I feel this, it, I don't know, it looks so unnatural to me. I, I, there's something in my mind that says this, this isn't real, this can't be real. Like the way that they're staring and talking, I feel like they're extremely aware of the camera. It looks staged to me. I mean, I've been in two documentaries and a lot of it you know, they kind of, the documentary makers kind of like, can you do this thing that you did organically, but we didn't catch it on film? Can you do it again? It's still real, but it didn't happen right then and there. <laughs> Blowed, you need a catalyst. And for the arcade era, that would come in 1978. Taito, 19... a Japanese company, released what many would consider to be the first blockbuster video game and the originator of the shoot 'em up genre. Space Invaders was the revolution. Yeah. It was the herald of the arcade culture that would soon follow. Using the same cost prohibitive and incredibly expensive quarter per play model adopted a decade prior, Space Invaders would go on to raise over $3.8 billion oh. in just four years, what? mostly in quarters. Adjusting this for inflation, <laughs> this would be worth over $16 billion today oh and make Space Invaders still- Dude, people really, really liked games, huh? Like even then. And look at the other games on this list, by the way. Pac-Man, Space Invaders, Dungeon Fighter Online, Street Fighter 2, Arena of Valor, Crossfire, League of Legends, wow. These are the ones that have earned the most gross million US dollars adjusted for with inflation. What? So Pac-Man is the most profitable game of all time adjusted for inflation. That's crazy. And look how rich Arena of Valor is. I played that game. It's a mobile MOBA. It was quite fun, but it's still mobile, so. Still one of the highest grossing video games ever made over 44 years later. After the success of Space Invaders, the arcade industry exploded. It was only a matter of time until something else would come along and steal that mantle. Space Invaders seems boring, you know, you just shoot at the dudes, but Pac-Man, it's more... Cool. Space Invaders... Wow. ...seems boring, you know, you just shoot at the dudes, but Pac-Man, it's more... Exciting. Though Space Invaders developers will not Groovy. be upset about their $3.8 billion in four years, it was put to shame by the success of Pac-Man, with over $6 billion gross revenue in just two years. That's arcades were absolutely booming at this time, and despite the prohibitive nature of what an arcade was, the model involved, they had taken over many other forms of entertainment and saw mainstream adoption. Now, in terms of the game design, we could probably draw a parallel between the popular roguelike genre now and what an Why is he playing the spooky music? <laughs> it's like we're all plucked into the Matrix, you know? arcade game actually was. You insert a coin for a set number of lives or time, and if you want to continue beyond those restrictions, you insert more coins. A pay-to-play experience during a time of inaccessible video game entertainment. If you were to transport this game mechanic to modern-day gaming, people would call this 
the worst monetization they'd ever seen. So what made it okay back then and why did it fall out of favor? Looking at this from both sides, the consumer and the service. First, the cost was necessary for arcade owners due to the massive overhead cost of maintaining a physical location. The power bills, the employees, the rent for buying cabinets of the newest games to stay relevant, yeah. maintenance of the cabinets and more. They needed to charge what retrospectively was a ridiculous fee so they could operate such a risky business. If there's anything I know about stories that have come out about McDonald's and their ice cream machines and how I see that companies nowadays handle uh, maintenance contracts for things like security cameras. Like if you get a company in the Netherlands to s install security cameras, 99% of them want to engage you in some kind of maintenance contract so that they can look at your cameras every year and say, yep, they're still working, which in my experience isn't necessary at all, but they just want to make sure to secure extra funding. I don't know if these arcade machines need as much maintenance. Maybe they do because people actually end up slamming them and stuff. They're probably a lot less careful with these machines than a person would be with their own equipment at home. As for why people would pay for these experiences, well, accessibility is likely the biggest factor. Home console they do need the maintenance, they were analog. Yeah, that makes sense. And people are, uh, that's where the term tilt comes from, right? Like a tilted gamer, a tilt is because you broke the machine or, or the, the machine auto blocked because it noticed you were trying to tamper with it, maybe steal the money. Souls has not really started to take off yet and their availability was pretty low. Even if you were lucky enough to have one, the games available for Pinball. those home consoles were oftentimes inferior to the ones that you would find in the arcade. Oh, because and one of the most yeah. important elements, the social experience and cultural relevance of these blockbuster games in this new cool venue. Arcades were the in thing and these games were taking over. Yeah. This made for the ability to charge substantial sums of money for essentially renting playtime and made it completely acceptable. Playtime yeah. that was often brutally difficult, a design that a cynical person might suggest was adopted to make consumers burn through their quarters faster no. in their pursuit of victory or no mastery. Way. The equivalent in 2022 would be you're playing Elden Ring but every time you die you have to slide a two dollar bill. Uh, let's see 586. I have 586 deaths so that's a th yeah that's 1100 1100 plus dollars so far that I lost in Elden Ring. <laughs> I'd be going broke. <laughs> adjusted for inflation into Gaben's g-string just to go again. Interestingly, the same reason people accepted this terrible monetization model was the same reason it saw a sharp decline immediately following the golden age. Accessibility made the arcades and it also killed them. As soon as you could buy a home console and play good games for a yep. single purchase in the convenience of your own home with no limitations on game time or queuing up to play what was popular, arcades started to decline heavily. It makes sense. It, I'm also surprised that like even as recently as 15 years ago, uh, internet cafes were really common uh, in different parts in the world. I guess America, Netherlands, Germany, France don't have as many gaming internet cafes as places such as um, Poland, Ukraine, South Korea uh, and China, in my experience traveling to these. But uh, still, and, and I think nowadays it's going to be hard also to make money just purely from a gaming internet cafe. You're going to have to sell culture, you're going to have to sell food, you're going to have to sell drinks as well, I think. You know, in Korea, like in 2004 or 5, do you know how much it is to get like a really good PC with all the games on it uh, per hour? Uh, 1,000 Korean won, which was about a dollar, uh, one US dollar per hour, which I found pretty cheap uh, compared to some other places. Usually it's like three, four, five uh, in uh, in the West. And the risk that was associated that made those costs necessary was realized. This was observable at first with the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System, more commonly referred to as the NES in the mid to late 80s, and more so with the release of the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, depending on where you live, <laughs> and the Super NES in the early 90s. The arcade industry clung onto life and even managed to have resurgences with super popular releases like Street Fighter 2 from Capcom, yeah. which did lend itself to playing in an arcade and something this. that's translated later in life to people buying the controls. Yeah, I played this in arcades, Street Fighter. This is the one that we wasted the most money on, or, or let's say enjoyed the most game time on, my brother and I. 
the arcade to get that true experience it was designed for but by the early 2000s the once overstimulating lights and sounds of the arcade were being turned off one by one across the globe never to be turned back on alongside the arcade industry's decline the release of the nes and the <laughs> ibm pc compatible <laughs> Why are they smiling like this? Alongside the arcade industry... <laughs> ...his decline, the release of the NES and the IBM PC compatible games were showing another form of monetization that made a lot more sense for the consumer. You buy the platform for your home, you buy the cartridge or the software, the disc, and you play as much as you want. The NES was the third console generation and the one to shift the tides of industry in the favor of retail game purchasers from that previous coin-fed dominance. The we never played on the Nintendo, uh, but we borrowed it from a neighbor once and we borrowed it from one of my brother's friends once. And the games we played was GoldenEye, Secret of Mana, uh, Secret of Evermore, and Sonic the Hedgehog. So those are the four games I played on Nintendo. The NES gained the mainstream traction with games like Super Mario Bros, Duck Hunt, Super Mario Four Bros. Bangers, 2 and 3, yeah. Tetris, and The Legend of Zelda. Around the same time, the PC was considered one of the fastest growing gaming markets globally, but around 19... Sonic wasn't on Nintendo? Oh, my bad. <laughs> I don't even remember. Sonic on Nintendo? <laughs> okay. On, on what then? What would it have been on? Like, I never made these decisions, okay? Other people arranged for these things to happen. I didn't make any decisions as a kid. I have three older brothers. I, I don't know. These are the games I played on console, period. The, don't make things difficult. It's globally, but around 1987, when sales of the NES were peaking with the European launch, people in the industry believed that Nintendo's success had literally destroyed the PC Ascension due to the lower price point, the easier compatibility, and again, the accessibility. In terms of the story of monetization though, both mediums maintained the status quo for monetization and this became the norm for over a decade. Each technological upgrade came with new hardware, new games, new accessories to purchase, but the principle remained the same. Console generations came and went without almost anything happening in this regard, from the Sega Genesis in 1988 to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990, all the way to the massive release of the Sony PlayStation in 1994. However, things were about to start changing drastically, and the catalyst at the center of these changes was the internet. Before mm. we had DLCs, before we had microtransactions on a large scale, expansion packs were the next sort of evolution of monetization and though they existed as early as the late 80s usually as free upgrades to existing games for pc they became truly prominent and popular in 1996 with the release of beyond the dark portal yeah. the expansion for warcraft 2 tied did blizzard really popularize expansions and maybe they were like i mean i guess kira did his research like it blows my mind that they're like one of the biggest expansion set uh, peddlers or let's say one of the most successful this excited the hell out of me i love the green color on it i love this box man this game was good Light of darkness this was the first real opportunity for companies to further monetize the experience beyond the widely accepted by the hardware by the game formula this just so happened to coincide with the rise of multiplayer gaming that was allowing the pc market to truly stand out from the offerings of consoles which was mostly Fight. local co-op or single player new genres were being born that existed to bring players together in online worlds most notably the massively multiplayer online role-playing game or mmorpg for short which would rise to prominence okay, in the mid to late 90s with games like nexus the kingdom of the winds in south korea Ultima. and Ultima uh -huh. online in the west these games brought with them a method of monetization that had Looks otherwise good. been mostly forgotten i feel like these graphics hold up pretty well uh to today like everything I saw here on this RPG still looks pretty good. But that's because art style is timeless, even though art fidelity, you know, can can become dated. Paying for time to play the game, with you losing the ability to play once that time ran out. Though instead of quarters in a slot, this was monthly subscriptions with a credit card. Mm. Now there are multiple examples of much smaller and more obscure experiences. By the way, you know what I don't understand is how did our parents agree to monthly credit card payments for games that's why i don't understand or or did you did you sneak did you sneak to copy the credit card deeds of your parents and they didn't know mine didn't <laughs> yours did it mine did it i never played wow i i didn't need a monthly subscription i remember 
my brother said he's gonna fight for us or at least that's how i remember it because we played this card game called Kran x and it's a tradable card game not even collectible right but actually tradable you could sell you could cry if you did a bad deal etc it was this online game probably inspired by magic the gathering probably came out like i don't know the year 2000 or earlier uh, and uh he actually convinced our dad to allow us to spend some money with the credit card to buy some cards it was super pog super hype i remember asking my brothers like how does it make sense why would we pay real money for fake cards like i know we like this digital game and i know we have fewer cards than our multiplayer competitors on the matchmaker but like why pay real money for digital cards it doesn't make any sense to me and then he was like uh, well i guess uh, real life cards are also fake they're just paper with print the meaning is what you attribute to it and digitally it's the same thing i was like oh yeah that's true but on the other hand you can still have your magic the gathering cards but chronics went down <laughs> so who has the last laugh now where are my cards the game is down anyway back to the video experience is the charge by the hour prior to this but they are not notable in how they shifted the gaming monetization. As games like Ultima Online were showing you that a subscription model could work, a multi-user dungeon commonly referred to as a MUD yes. would begin testing what many consider the first ever true microtransactions. I remember playing MUDs. I thought they were kind of boring because they had no graphics. Like the concept was kind of cool. We would be on our laptop and you would play and it'd be, it'd be all text-based and you would have to type things like attack or walk left. And then it was multiplayer, which was pretty sick. An MMORPG, essentially, via a MUT multiplayer user dungeon. But boring because it was all text-based. It's full exposition and no graphics. I'm very visually inclined to so. Archeo Dreams of Divine Lands, a text-based game, auctioned off high-quality items from the game for real-world money. Uh... After figuring out that people would be willing to pay for these items and not only pay, but pay large sums of money, the developer then implemented the world's first dual currency system. What oh no! Can we go back in time and 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 go to those people and just be like, uh, just close their wallets? Like, don't pay for this. It's gonna change everything. You're gonna ruin it for us. You'll ruin it. One currency that is earned in game, and another that comes from real world purchase. This, unlike the subscription model, didn't take off as quickly in the industry, but as computers and the internet were more widely available, so too were free-to-play browser games that implemented secondary currency and premium subscriptions of their own. The MMORPG genre was almost always at the forefront of bringing in popularity of alternative monetization, and it wasn't long until games like MapleStory would release to massive commercial success, using the free-to-play model of others before it, and bringing in huge profits from what some may refer to as a premium cash shop model. Yeah. This is where things begin to move very quickly for monetization. From the late 90s to the early 2000s, we saw probably the biggest shift in monetization yet. The advancement of online games. And Wait, was that, wasn't that a boxing game on the Wii? This reminds me of the Wii. Oh yeah, we saw. We actually see it right there. Yeah, yeah. we saw the the, the probably the, the biggest sports, shift yeah. in monetization yet. The advancement of online games and what this brought to the table was soon adopted on consoles with services like Xbox Live and their marketplace. As too was the ability to buy microtransactions to expand the lifespan of already developed games who to this point saw most of their sales in the first handful of months and little return after. The most mm. well-known example of this, of course. Don't do it. Don't pay money for this horse armor with real money. Is the fabled Elder Scrolls Oblivion horse armor DLC in 2006. Though this was not the first, just the one that garnered all the attention when it released. While previously expansion packs would add potentially dozens of hours to the game experience or revamp online tools to refresh the player base, yeah. these DLCs were instead entirely cosmetic. If you were to believe online forums at the time or how people remember this, the horse armor was received extremely poorly. It was also one of the top selling DLCs made for the game even years later. Oh. You know what they really needed? You know what was sorely missing in every stage of humankind's history? Digital influencers. If influencers had just told them not to buy it, here's why it's bad, don't get this armor, it's gonna change everything, then everyone could have been influenced and not go and do it. Right? You needed more of us. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, you naive summer child. It's not naive. I'm joking. It's different. I'm pretending to be naive for the purpose of sense of humor. When actual content had also been sold, a very clear success and an indicator that regardless of what you thought about it, people would buy it and it would continue. This DLC yep. model was adopted by AAA Gaming over the next few Original game expansion pack. <laughs> what is this? What is this? Years and eventually became not just commonplace. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is good. So the original game is just, it's complete, right? It's the Mona Lisa. It's complete. It's perfect. It's deep. There's layers to it. There's there's areas of discovery. There's nuance. The expansion pack, you know, they draw it in more. There's, it's bigger, better, more beautiful, whatever, at least options. Or maybe it's a, no, no, no. That's not what it means, right? It's a different painting. The expansion pack is a different painting altogether. It does not modify the original. It does not emulate the original. It's just new content. It's it's it's, it's by this itself. The DLC model was adopted by AAA Gaming over the next few. Then expansion pack is what is this? Like it's the top right of her hair again. <laughs> years and eventually became not just commonplace, but ex <laughs> you know, I, I've always wondered, right? The first example he mentioned of the big one popping off, Warcraft Beyond the Dark Portal, Warcraft 2 Beyond the Dark Portal. I always wondered, did you know you're going to make an expansion? Because you didn't tell us when the game came out. Did you know? I need to know if you knew that you knew you're going to do it, but you were holding back on purpose. Did you know? Or did you say, hey, this first one sold really well after three months. Uh, let's quickly make another one. And then six months later, they came out with an expansion. And if you knew that you were going to do an expansion, okay, did you intentionally leave out content that could have gone to the original and that was in fact already ready or almost ready? If so, damn it. I've been had. I have been had. You pulled the wool over my eyes. And whereas I didn't even begin to consider it for Beyond the Dark Portal, I think the illusion was shattered for me with Blizzard for StarCraft 2 when they announced from the very get-go at the start that StarCraft 2 is going to come out in three parts, each a full game, each completely autonomous and therefore also charged as a full game, right? You can you only need to buy one and you can play all the multiplayer and everything, but what you're buying is also the campaign of that race. That's when I knew, like, okay, they're milking it. They don't want to sell the game once anymore. They want to sell it three times. And that looks greedy to me. That looks like they're trying to change the status quo. And nonetheless, Thor from Pirate Software said that one WoW cosmetic sold more than Wings of Liberty. Sold more profit than Wings of Liberty because of course Wings of Liberty has way more cost than one effing cosmetic in WoW expected okay, okay. as a default at this time the dlc offerings would mostly just add on to the game however developers only needed to glance over a browser and mmrpg games to see that players would be willing to pay for even more given yep. the option and the option would people will pay twelve thousand dollars to buy a digital house in an unreleased game that has been funded and underfunded through kickstarter underfunded overfunded under budgeted under deliver over promise they will buy real estate in fictional games would be given more and more frequently even in single player game at this point there was proof that players would not only pay for content for their games but also cosmetics just three short years after the horse armor fifa 09 adopted the next model that would go on to raise billions for companies like ea and of course, I'm talking about the loot box. This being a feature that had again been lifted wow. from the MMORPG genre, and more specifically, Maple Story Japan. Though, of course, the underlying mechanics of this feature could be seen in other industries for decades. By 2013, we also had the introduction of the Battle Pass, which came from Valve's Dota 2, which was originally called the Compendium and accompanied their yearly blockbuster tournament, commonly referred to as. Let's see, who are these uh, handsome gentlemen? I know the these. compendium and accompanied the S4, Budok, Loda, a yearly block. I don't know these two. Buster tournament, commonly referred to as T. Puppy, don't know him. Kuroki. 
guy. Is, sure. Is that dandy? Is that mind control? That would make this havosh, no? For the international. It wasn't long until gaming had grown into a monster of industry, bigger than ever before, bigger than the companies raising billions of dollars a year for the arcade cabinets, and companies being valued in the tens of billions of dollars, with yearly revenue growing consistently, to the point other entertainment industries were being eclipsed. With yep. this growth, the availability of tools, and of course the market for games that didn't house as many of these practices, we also saw the rise of the indie game, which is a massive market in and of itself as of 2022. Now, this is what I believe to be a condensed version of the history of monetization, but this isn't where the road ends. There's another large shift looming on the horizon, and it is unfortunately called blockchain. I believe if you learn uh. anything from the Oblivion Horse Armor situation, it should be that regardless of how loud the shouting is, if there's money being made, if there's people willing to buy something, it will most likely be pushed by the companies that stand to make the money. Eventually, people come to terms with things. They accept them as the norm. Things like DLCs, loot box, microtransactions, and the goalposts move from what is a good DLC versus what is a bad DLC. They wear us down. They wear us down. And anytime there's a large pushback, then they're going to roll it back and they're going to come out with a slightly less egregious version. And we're like, well, it's not as bad as their first plan. They listen to us. And then they've paved the way for the next guy to come in, the next company to come in and uh, offer something slightly worse. What is a good NFT? What is a bad NFT? This hopefully is not a guarantee, but it does seem to be where the monetization arrow is pointing, at least for now. People are shouting right now about NFTs and cryptocurrency, this looming threat known as play to earn, and yet some of the biggest companies in the industry are seemingly embracing it with open arms. It's been three decades since the CoinFed arcade model was replaced by something many, including myself, would consider to just be a much better overall model, and it will be interesting to see where we go from here. This is the part where maybe you get jaded, but I'll offer you some perspective that may help. While ever there is a market of people who have money to spend and refuse to adopt the new direction. <laughs> what is this stock footage? She's so sad about NFTs. The, the two of them are talking about NFT games and how they're playing games to earn uh, crypto. And she's like, I can't listen to this shit anymore. Action they dislike there will be companies that pop up to serve you. We've got more choice of games than ever before, more access to AA and indie developed projects that give us the experience of buy and play with nothing additional added, and that will continue to increase in number and quality so long as the market of consumers that support that continue to do so. Once a are there companies that are selling once and then giving everything else for free or like selling once and that's it? Are they doing it because they believe in it ethically or because it is the way to get the goodwill for jaded people who are jaded, not jaded people, for people who are jaded with the stupid monetization process. There's, there are some cynical people that will say that they're just doing it for reputation. A company will only attempt ever, the only thing a company ever tries is to make money. I don't believe in that. I know a company's mission statement is to make money and there's some people that are devoutly convinced that anything a company does where they leave money on the table, if they are leaving money on the table, they're doing it to virtue signal in order to become more popular to people that are jaded with the over monetization process and tendency of the rest of the world. I don't believe it. I, maybe I'm naive or an optimist, but I think some companies are saying uh, they're not doing it just to virtue signal. They actually don't believe in that shit. They hate it as much as anyone. And they're accepting that maybe without all those manipulative psychological methods that you could put into games that are common in some mobile games, they can still make ends meet and that's good enough for them. You're full grubby? Perhaps. Perhaps. Why Do you care why it does the right thing? You could argue that it doesn't matter, that you will just support the thing that you like uh, the method of sale that you like, you will support it and that is enough of a feedback loop and you will simply not uh, budge from your principles. Some companies might act on value, yes, but still a company wants to make money, yeah. So for Larian, for instance, are they staying true to the sell once and support the game principle because they believe in better? Or is it just a virtue signal or to show uh, a different side of the coin to overly, overly monetizing things? I believe people that make decisions in companies, especially private companies, huh, 
they can inject their own desires into policy, such as let's not be scumbags like that. And I don't think it's just uh, a, an alternative strategy to making more money in order to capitalize on the goodwill of people that now uh, are rooting for you. The company gets too big, they will most likely adopt the positions of the current AAA industry, but another will pop up to replace them. Just like loot boxes, DLCs, or anything else wasn't the end of you having fun in gaming, I don't think NFTs or blockchain will either. This is the history, or at least a large portion of the history, of video game monetization. I find things like this super helpful to research, to just look at and say, this is where we were, this is where we've been, and this could be where we end up. I believe the industry is too big now to hope that there will be a continuation of that cycle and we go back to purely buying a game and purely buying a console but at least with how big the industry is we also now have the choice as individuals what True. we can accept and more importantly what we can enjoy say no to play to earn thank you very much for watching see you on the next one stay safe out there peace kira tv has even more videos on monetization that i've really enjoyed uh, this was a relatively short one very good video definitely uh check out his channel i've pretty much watched 50 to 100 of his videos recently pretty much all of these i've watched and uh he has he has a really good dictation yep hope you enjoyed it